Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com, and this is Jelly Bean. Jelly Bean because she's got a big head and a little body, and Jelly Bean because she's little but she's sweet. Ain't she? Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the access that you've given us by grace and the privilege to feast upon your word. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had pretty much concluded chapter 11, and we're getting ready to move into the 12th chapter. And I think that it would be probably be a good idea at the outset here to, to kind of review what we've been studying uh, in the previous 11 chapters. I believe that this video will prove that Christianity today, and I put that in quotes, has fallen away from the faith. I believe we are living in an age in which the departure from the faith has already occurred. That it's not something future that many believe will happen in an instant when the church is gone, but that you and I were born into it. We were actually born into it. And just how would I define that apostasy? Well, simply like this. It's not law. It's not law mixed with grace, which destroys grace, and would therefore still be law. It is grace. It's not that churches don't teach grace. Pulpits have to present what's been clearly written. They can't skip over these verses. Now, I have, I have known churches that will actually do that, but... The problem is one of consistency, of being consistent. We can't present grace one moment just to do an about face and then bring law in alongside it because some verse seems to contradict it. And this is what modern Christianity, for the most part, has done and is doing today. Throughout the centuries, since God decreed, covenanted to save man, through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ, whereby He provided a full, perfect, and sufficient satisfaction for our sins. One aberration of the gospel has recurrently threatened the truth. It is the view that man must make some contribution himself in securing his salvation. It, it's not the size of this contribution that is the important factor, but the necessity of it. In short, the difference between a monergistic, God only, and a synergistic faith, God and man, between a God only and a God and man gospel, the difference between those two, folks, is nothing less than the difference between the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the one hand, and all other religious systems, whether they're pagan or Christian, on the other. There are basically only two alternatives. If man contributes any essential part towards his salvation, then he effectively becomes his own savior, even if that contribution takes no more concrete form than, than that of merely allowing God to act by non-resistance. What we have been shown here in Romans is that in a fallen world, God's grace must be irresistible or man's will can remain forever opposed to God 
And the will of the creature overrides the will of the Creator. In truth, there, there is no gospel that's not entirely rooted in the sovereignty of God's grace. To depart from this is to surrender the whole by giving it a logical incoherence which makes it indefensible whether from Scripture or by reason. The crucial issue is the sovereignty of God's grace in the most absolute sense. The only defense against this is an honest and consistent interpretation of Scripture ascribing all the glory to God, all of it, not just some of it, not just most of it, but all of it, by insisting upon the total depravity of man, an election based solely upon the good pleasure of God, a substitutionary death for those who are His, a grace that can neither be resisted nor earned, and a security for the believer that's as permanent as God Himself. Now folks, if, a, if such a system creates some problems because of the limitations of our comprehension, the problems it creates are not nearly as serious as the problems of another kind created by the alternatives, which in fact destroy the gospel altogether by dishonoring the sufficient sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's quickly review what we've been through, or what we've seen throughout these chapters, which is, is seldom, if, if ever, taught today by most churches. We started out in this study in the Epistle to the Romans, and we were called beloved. We're loved. I don't know how many Christians don't even think God loves them. It is not sure that God loves them. We were called saints. If that doesn't stop you dead in your tracks, God doesn't call something something that's not. We're called saints. Why? Because we are. We're, we're given grace, peace. It's, we looked at faith's righteousness, the, the, faith that, the righteousness that belongs to faith, not the righteousness that belongs to works, that the just shall live by faith. Wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judgest doest the same things. By the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. We saw the righteousness of God without the law being manifested the righteousness of God without the law being manifested. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, not because of anything we did, propitiation through faith in His blood, God is satisfied with the travail of His soul, boasting, being excluded, that, that we establish the law Though not under the law, we still establish the law. That kind of throws people a curve. But Scripture goes on to explain how that is accomplished. The blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. I mean, come on. Folks, are these the things that you're being told and taught from pulpits all across America and all across the world? No, they're not whose iniquities are forgiven, all, all sins covered, all sins forgiven, and to, to whom the Lord will not impute sin, for where no law is, there's no transgression. Imputed righteousness. Children of promise. Jesus being raised because, uh, because of our being made righteous. The only reason He raised from the dead was, is because God made us righteous that we have access to God by faith into this grace wherein we stand. While we were yet sinners, Christ died in our place, substitutionary, not provisional. When we were enemies, when we were His enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Election is already being presented, though, though the direct subject is yet to be addressed. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so in like manner, by the obedience of the one, Christ Jesus, shall many, his people, be made righteous. We saw that we were dead to sin, alive unto God, identified with Christ, that the body of sin is annulled, not destroyed, but made rendered inoperative, that we, we are freed from sin. 
we see that we were we are to yield ourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead and our members as instruments of righteousness unto God that sin won't have dominion over us for because we're not under the law but under grace and that to whom we yield our ourselves servants to obey his servants we are to whom we obey old versus new man we are servants of righteousness now being made free from sin and become servants to God we have our fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord these truths folks are comforting truths of grace that you seldom hear taught today why because the church has departed from the faith cleverly devised fables that's 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 what we're looking at today the problem's not with the law the problem is with us the law is holy we were told it's the law is holy the commandment holy and just and good the problem is not with the law the problem is with us with the mind we we you know we have the conflict between the spirit and the flesh with the mind we serve the law of god but with the flesh the law of sin and deliverance is is what through our own self-effort no it's only through christ no condemnation we saw there's there's no condemnation for those who are in christ that god has nothing against us man if if pastors today just stood up behind the pulpit and said to the to their congregations god has nothing against you think of the of the the change that would be take place as a result of that you don't hear that you very seldom hear that god condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk how after the law no not after the law but after the spirit grace we're debtors folks we we are, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh it's it's through the spirit that we mortify we relegate the old man to the cross where he belongs the deeds of the body and and we live we are led by the spirit of god we're the sons of god we've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear we've been adopted into god's household we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies and that just that's just the tip of the iceberg I'm just, I, I don't see how any of you folks out there listen, hearing me now can not be astounded over the fact that there are so many precious truths that are just thrown, thrown aside, trampled on. Precious truths that we need to know. It's through these great and precious promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. The Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God, we're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, we're promised the redemption of our body, the Spirit makes intercession for us according to God's will, all things work together for good, that is all things, not just some or most things, but all things, all things, predestinated, called, justified, glorified, precious, precious words that Christians today are actually offended by. That he freely gives us all things. That nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And I don't know how many Christians I've met who believe that they can separate themselves from Christ. That we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. That it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. And they don't like that. That redemption is based on our being God's elect. Israel followed after the law of righteousness, but they didn't attain to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they sought it through law, and that is exactly what our, the modern religious system of our time is doing. What I refer to as the system, religious system based on human merit. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. That's how the flesh and the law operates. It is to re redeemed people. That the call is made regarding salvation since by grace it's it's no more of works otherwise grace is no more grace you can't mix the two yet Christianity has has succeeded wholeheartedly in doing that God has concluded all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all and yet the idea is, is still that 
we must do something to be redeemed and we must continue to do something to be saved and that is apostasy folks it's apostasy and we're living in it and now we are being called upon Romans 12 1 through 2 to present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, and be not conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word conform there is falling into step with a world religious system, kind of reminds me of peer pressure. It's, you know, we're doing what everyone else is doing. That's conformed. A much different word than transformed, metamorphosis. The problem is an identity crisis, folks. That identity crisis is a result of a failure within today's religious system to teach these simple, straightforward truths of Scripture. That religious system is exposed through these truths. Just these truths alone expose it for what it is. That system is blind to the fact that it is being described in the very book that they hold dear. And God does have his people within that religious system based on human merit. But God calls his people out of, out from away, away from that religious system. Like Israel, those within that religious system possess a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The simplicity of Christ is what is missed. Christ, the stumbling block, the stumbling stone. And that simplicity is this, that it is not about what we must do for Christ. It never has been, never will be. But what about, but it's about what Christ did for us. Modern Christianity has reversed God's order and they're preaching law, not grace. We read Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 saying, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. That's devotion to Christ, folks. It's not devotion to self. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, Paul says to them, you bear this beautifully. The word beautifully in the Greek literally means bearing with it. Uh, the word means enduring, suffering, persisting in it, putting up with it. As we enter the 12th chapter, folks, we're confronted with a powerful verse that has to do with sacrifice. Ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable, logical, the word is legizomai in the Greek, it's logical, service or worship. And those words, folks, stand upon the shoulders of all that has gone before us in this epistle. It is a command. It's in the imperative mood. We're, we're moving into the area of sanctification, life, growth. Our being referred to as a living sacrifice is not, here's what it's not. It is not our viewing the sacrifice of, of Christ as insufficient, whereby we view Christ as not having done enough, where that we must make that sacrifice effective or sufficient by what we do. That is modern Christianity. We are living sacrifices because we have been raised from the dead to walk in newness of life, His life. Dead to the law that we might bear fruit unto God. It is our living, the life that God gave us, understanding who we are, living as who we are, as who we have become. No wonder God refers to this as only logical, our reasonable service of worship. No wonder it says we're not to be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of our mind. It is a mind renewal. The word means a change of heart and life so that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Folks, this is where we've come to in this study in Romans. 
I want to thank you all for all of your prayers, your ongoing, your continued prayers for this ministry, for all of your love, your messages of encouragement and support. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.